Oh, that took so long, is it? Major network outage. So welcome to the people that are external. Sorry that we've missed the first half an hour of the recording, but we, there was a technical issue with the recording system and the whole uh, audio visual in the lecture theatre. So we're now actually just been working on the interview exercise, trying to code the answers to the interview sample, which I've put up in Blackboard. So after we've done that, we'll just go back to actually doing the lecture. You can find a copy of that um, interview in Blackboard under the Lecture 8 for this week. So we have an external cohort as well. All right, let's see if we can get up some slides about what we're doing. It's going to take a couple of seconds because I have to log on. So have you finished? No, some people still working.
some of the things that are the main similar to what you've probably got. So that's my, some of the answers that were given here. Many reasons, though we already moved a step further because we said encourage, someone said encouragement. You've got football jogging and the age. So their age is, in, he's concerned about age. So we're picking that up. We'll just put that. Now, see the little black notes there, the researchers put, are reminded to themselves. So constantly you're sort of reminding yourself, check that out when other people are going to answer these questions. They might be saying something similar. So that's a possible thing. The next question, injuries, weight gain, type of work feels that he has to exercise to continue control body. Again, is this something that you might look at with some other interviewees when you get to talk with them? Last paragraph, jogging, need for fitness, the team, social aspects are important here. Okay, so then there's another note about the other interviews. Okay, so based on this and what you actually just did in your answers, see if you can develop a few nodes. So remember, a node is a theme in en vivo. Let's see if you can create, it just, you know, it can be one word or it might be, say for example, encouragement could have been a node, but you need some support for developing that node. So have a go and see if you can make those red answers there or, and your own into a few nodes. Thank you.
Of course, bear in mind you've only got one interview. <laughs> you really need a few. Sorry? That would help, wouldn't it? Let's assume it's around. Uh, what we could. Well, what would you like it to be? Why do people participate in sports? And that would be a really nice thing because it's got a social aspect to it. I mean, that's a, that's a good point to raise. Besides encouragement, what's another general theme that you could put to question one? Motivation. And that's all you need to actually have for your node is motivation for playing sport or motivation. And so when people start tell you, you know, I wanted to get fit or pe uh, school encourage me or parent, you just slot them all under the node of motivation. All right, we better move on, I suppose, because we've lost about half an hour in now. All right, so just categorising a bit more. We could have had type of sport. We could have had motivation, the reasons for playing sport, what sort of challenges you have, which was the injuries. Or if you had a few more interviews, you could go, we're interested in the type of sport, so we've got now, we might have people playing rugby, badminton, cricket. The reasons for playing sport, social interaction, encouraging, uh, sorry, managing weight gain. But it could have been uh, just because they enjoyed it. It doesn't have to be because they're playing with someone else. And, there's, and people could talk about more challenges such as the expense of playing sport, the time commitment, and of course we already had injuries. So it's just to give you an idea of how you sort of abstract categories from what people say. You might have do this this time and go and go and interview two or three more people and find that you need to modify it. <clears throat> so don't be afraid that you know it's set as it is. So you start off thinking these are the categories but then someone else says something different and you go around again to think about whether these are actually all that there is or whether they're the right ones. 
when you actually finish coding all the interviews, say you had 10, and you find that you are not finding any more categories, so there's no more codes, everyone's starting to say the same things. That's what we call saturation, and that means you should stop. You don't need to interview any more people because you now know that the people are saying the same things over. You're not collecting anything new. So if, even if you thought I should do 20, but by 15 you found everyone saying the same thing, you can stop. All right. This is just a sample of the types of possible coding types. This might help you with your assessment task because it just might jog you, because we tend to think of the same ones ourselves um, and not explore new ones. So it could be around the context of which you uh, got your interview. Obviously, it could be the perspectives of the people that you're interviewing. It could be about what they think about other people and objects, their opinions. It could be about the process that they've actually gone through or the activity or the strategy. And then I think later in your task, you'll probably be looking at relationships about things. So how does something connect to something else? And they're pre-assigned coding schemes. Well, you've already been given four nodes in your assessment task. So um, that's a big help to start you off. All right, we might actually have a five minute break and then I'll go back over the stuff that we missed at the beginning of the lecture and then we'll have a quick look at MVivo. But just take five minutes to have a break. So we'll start again at 10 to.
Okay, what we might do is just go back to the video on ethnography. Sorry, we're jumping around, but you can't help technical problems. So this is um, a talk from TEDx. So if you might be familiar, TEDx, uh, there's a series of TEDx talks that people talk on contemporary issues. It's like a think tank type of um, series. And this lady is works as an ethnographer in New York, and she's just going to share a couple of studies that they, well, an old one about the invention of photocopies, copiers, and how to use them, and then about her parking. So we'll just watch it for five minutes or so. She has no sound. Let's go back to the 1980s when a Xerox copier took up an entire room. <laughs> There was another park scientist, Lucy Suchman, and she had the idea that maybe if you're building technology for people, you should watch them using it. So she decided to watch some people using a Xerox copier. She grabbed a couple of her colleagues from down the hall, and she asked them to make copies. So I'm going to show you a short clip of a video from this historic video of these two people making copies. Place one to 50 originals. Well, wait a minute, I have 100 originals. Face up. Place all originals against the left wall. We want two-sided copies. Unload top paper tray. Now, do we want them collated? What? Reverse order the originals? You gotta be kidding. Yeah. This is 
definitely a bug. Press start. Does that relate to that? Our top paper we didn't tray. Do that. That's not this. That's not the paper tray. It doesn't say what the paper tray is. No? So our, our first batch. Our first batch. Is SOL. What is that? Shit out of Well, we sure did come up with a lot of paper. <laughs> Those two people from down the hall are world-renowned computer scientists. One of them went on to win the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in computer science. <laughs> so clearly the problem is not that the people are dumb, the problem is with the design of the copier. Today it is now common practice for companies to do what's called usability testing. But back then it wasn't done. Lucy Stutzman had to think of it. And she went further. She realized that you could use, observe people, not just to figure out how to make their products easier to use, but also to figure out what products to build in the first place. So this practice of observing people in their natural environments to understand their needs is called ethnography. At the time, it was an academic practice. It grew out of anthropology. Lucy Suchman was the first one to apply it to industry. So even today, not everybody uses ethnography. Most companies will try to understand their customers' needs by asking them directly using tools like focus groups or surveys. But asking people to tell you what they want gets you only so far. As the anthropologist Margaret Mead said, what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are entirely different things. <laughs> When people do their jobs or just any ordinary activity, much of what you do just becomes invisible to you. It's just what you do. But if you watch people, you start to realize a lot of times people are working around their tools. And it's these gaps or problems people work, people work around that are opportunities for innovation. The thing is, a lot of times when you point them out to people, they'll say, well, sure, it's obvious that's a problem. But they don't think to tell you about it when you ask. To notice it, you have to get out and watch. So I like to think of my job as an ethnographer like this. You sit and you watch the chaos that is human behavior. And if you're patient and you watch for a while and you have a naive state of mind, you start to notice insights that are obvious after you point them out. You start to notice the hidden obvious. Well, how does this work? What is ethnography like? Well, let me give you two examples from my work. So the last couple of years, I've been studying parking. Now, I realize parking is an odd place to go looking for technology opportunities, uh, but we all know New York is especially the parking is an area where there's a lot of problems and a lot of needs not being met. So to study parking, my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time hanging around on street corners, watching cars parking, <laughs> trucks unloading, enforcement officers giving tickets, and we've seen a lot of things you might expect and some that you might not. <laughs> So one of the things that we started to notice gradually was the parking signs and how difficult it can be to tell the one thing you want to know quickly, can I park here now in the few seconds you have as you're driving by? So I'm going to show you a sign for about that amount of time and I want you to figure out, can you park here now? Let's say it's Wednesday early in the morning at 7 a.m. Can you park here now? <laughs> Okay, let's look again. Okay, this is hard not just because there's so much going on, but you'll notice that Wednesday is not mentioned and 7 a.m. is not in any of the time ranges. So you have to infer that because it's not covered, you can park here, at least to the left of the signs. Okay, here's another one. It's 3 p.m., can you stop here now? <laughs> okay, let's look again. So the bottom sign says no parking at 3 p.m. So that implies that you can stop. And the top, no stopping sign, doesn't cover 3 p.m. So that implies, again, you, can, you have to figure out that you can stop here. Okay, and here's one more where I challenge you to figure out what you can do here at any time. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the problem here is that parking signs focus on restrictions. No this, no that, when what you want to know is what you can do. Now, when I say it like this, it seems obvious, but when you go and you ask people to tell you what are some of your problems you have with parking, they generally don't go complaining and saying, you know, parking signs are difficult to read quickly as you drive by because they focus on restrictions. To really understand this, you have to get out and watch. And it can take a while. We, because we were looking at so many different aspects of parking, the signs didn't really come into focus for us until the fourth city and over a thousand photos and videos. Once we noticed it, it was obvious. <laughs> 
So what could you do about this? Well, one thing you could do is redesign the signs. And so here's one possible way you could design that second sign. And it's on the right, you see it's organized by time of day, from morning through night. So at any time you can find now, and then you can just look to the right and see, can I park? Green, yes. Red, no. Orange, there's some kind of restriction. Like here, it's deliveries only. And if you want to be kind to internationals, you could include symbols. <laughs> Okay, so that's one example of how ethnography found an unmet need. Let me give you another one. So we noticed a lot of times when we were out looking that there were a lot of loading zones marked by yellow curbs that weren't being used. Here we are looking for a parking spot and it's just loading as far as the eye can see and not very many trucks using it and yet we can't park. On the other hand, we saw a lot of times when trucks were trying to make deliveries and couldn't find a loading zone. And since they have to park near where they're going to be delivering, they get creative. So they double park and they block in cars, both diagonal and parallel. They park in the median, blocking cars from turning left. They park in the crosswalk, blocking people from crossing the street. And they park on the sidewalk. <laughs> so the problem here is that loading zones take up precious parking resources and yet they don't really meet the need. Again, I point this out, seems obvious, but when we talk to people about their parking problems, they don't say loading zones are inefficient, they say there's not enough parking. So what can you do about this? Well, what you really like to do is to have the spots for loading when they're needed and then make them available to everyone else when they're not. So this is something we're doing right now. We have built a prototype parking meter that can change its state from parking to loading, no parking in other states. And since trucks have GPSs, oops, or tr they have GPSs and they know uh, where they're going, um, we can take a spot and change it from parking to loading and then when they come and they park, they can put it back to parking. Okay, so what does all this have to do with Broadway? <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say is that, well, I don't know what you need to do to make Broadway the best it can be. You can get some ideas by using ethnography. It's a very general tool. We've used it in many different domains, hospitals, nursing, call centers, retail stores, young people using mobile devices, lots more, and you could use it on Broadway. So you could accompany a family as they're spending a day out on Broadway. Or you could watch someone as they're planning a day for, or an evening for a night out and a show. Or you could just hang out at the tickets booth and watch people buying tickets or people checking into hotels or people choosing a restaurant or window shopping or going to a show, all those things. And maybe if you're patient and you do it for a while and you keep a naive state of mind, maybe you will discover the hidden obvious. Maybe you'll be the one to think of a novel idea that people will take for granted in 20 years. Thank you. Does that give you a bit more idea of ethnography? You can see it takes quite a lot of time and resource to actually um, come up with the results. Okay. Ah. Okay, let's just keep it close. No. Okay. Got to get back to where I... Anyway, th th I have put that link up if you wanted to look at it again. Um, all right, let's keep moving. Try and go back to where we were. So we'll skip all that. Uh, just to note for the people online that I did say on this slide that we would look at content and discourse analysis in week eight, and the people in the room actually did a little bit, and we talked just briefly about that while we were waiting for the audio visual to be uh, fixed but I will put the slides up for everyone in more detail after the lecture so you can look at those. That's just a reminder of what we did last week with the types of interview questions. And we will skip. That's what we talked about. Scott Morrison, the comics. Advantages, disadvantages. Okay, so now this is where I want to go to is when you're organising qualitative data. Now, in the break, we had an interesting discussion, a uh, couple of us, around the difference in your thinking when you're doing qualitative research to stats. So it's, it's, it's bringing ambiguity into some order when you do qualitative. Now, the question was around how do you know how to make these categories? Now, bear in mind, 
when you're doing this sort of research, you've already looked at existing literature, remember, in your research design. So you're already thinking about what other people are saying on the topic. So that could give you some ideas of themes or nodes or categories. Then we were suggesting that you might only do a couple of interviews before you actually start analysing like what you did this morning and bringing them into the theme categories, possible theme categories, before you actually went and did some more. Some people, as I mentioned previously, they do pilots. So they just do a couple, they sh shape their questions a bit more and then go and do others. Um, but all the time, and one of the disadvantages you have with your assignment is that you actually haven't undertaken the interviews. You haven't been the researcher doing the interviews. Because when you're actually doing that, you're listening to what the people are saying and you're already in the back of your mind picking up key things, key words they're saying, key themes you keep hearing, and you're registering them in the back of your mind. So you haven't got that advantage with the assessment task. But what we were saying was that you should be looking at the five, like we did this morning, underlining what's important, trying to get the key words, and then you, you will get there. It's, it, when you're looking at stats and it says 60% of people believe this, that's very easy because it's objective. You're now adding a subjective element into your research with qualitative research. There's decisions you have to make. There's a confidence you have to have to know that when you come up with these themes, that they're sound. You have to be rigorous about how you do that. But there is an element that, say, someone over here gets certain themes, over here might be slightly different, over here might be a different perspective again. So what we're just doing in this intro course is really just giving you a little bit of a taste of what that feels like. But over time, if you keep doing it, you will get more confident in trying to make all of these things out there into themes. It's a bit like concept mapping. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it's easy to get the, the main heading and the detail around the edge of a concept map. But when you have to take all of those things at the edge and bring them into another group category, that takes a bit of work. So all of this doesn't happen just, you know, in the five minutes I've given you in the class. You could be working on this for weeks. You know, uh, if you're doing a PhD, it goes on your head for like a year or two, just all the thinking. So take heart. Um, the exercise that you're doing for your assessment task is a good one for you to actually start developing some of these skills. So a few tips from me uh, along with that is about organising the data. Okay. So the context around that is, as what I've just said, it's quite complex what you're going to get because people are sharing lots of different things with you and you have a mass of data. And they're all words, uh, and there's no neat categories. No one's giving you, well, you've got four, but usually in real life, nobody's giving you the categories. You have to come up with them. So if you were actually doing the interview or running the photo groups, I talked to you about this at the time. It's hard to keep notes during the time you're doing it. It is possible in some circumstances, obviously, like participant observation, you take notes. Maybe in a interview you could take some notes, but you really should be trying to engage with the person. So it's challenging. So you're recording it, remember. You you've got your transcriptions. But if you're in the field and you're observing something or talking to a group, you may be able to write what they call field notes or a diary. Your reflections are when you actually talk to that person a log of the details of each time you actually went. So you're, you're making little jottings down. They're usually the thoughts about the ones you saw in black and the answers we had that said, ask the other participants about that. Maybe this is really important. So you think you might remember them, but over time you won't. So the key is to be organised enough to do it while you're actually on the process. Just could be a little scrap notebook or whatever, but write down what it is you think is important. Don't rely on your memory. Of course, same with transcriptions. If you've got consent, you do need to ask permission from people if you're writing notes. So make sure that if you can, have the discipline to actually write up some notes after you've done that, uh, because that can help you in your transcription. Now. I did have a slide, which you'll see later before, of transcription. It's very detailed. It's word for word of what people 
are saying. You can do that yourself, okay? But if you had resources, you can pay other people. Sorry, that's not really the right slide to what I'm talking about. But you can pay other people who are experienced at transcribing interviews to do it for you. There are technology things out at the moment we're experimenting with that you can put the recorder down and it'll actually transcribe back to you um, what they're saying. It's not 100%, so just be careful about that. Um, but just be mindful, you can actually get that done for you because it's very time consuming. So if you're at work, you may have the resource or you have to write a budget for this work, make sure you put in for somebody to actually do that for you. Um, when you come to your own personal organising of these files, if you're doing a really big project, a lot of it is around an organisational uh, approach, um, being very organised. You can get yourself in a huge mess if you don't structure your folders, structure everything very carefully. Because, you know, so this is an example for my own work. So I had, remember I had two case studies, so I made folders. Now under that, of course, is a whole lot of things. Then I had another one there for document analysis, field notes, the final report, the interview transcriptions, the literature review, my reflections, other project documents I collected, any publications I was thinking, so you might have to write a report at work. Just be very careful at the beginning and as you go along to keep it very clear. Now some people can do that easier than others. If you struggle with uh, organising lots of documents and things, just work hard to try and actually get some clear categories. Remember, of course, in, you know, on your computer, you can change the name of the folder, but just try to keep them categorised. Um, and of course, those little symbols, that there is for Envivo. So I use that, I'll show you an example in a minute. And of course, you've got EndNote as well for all of your uh, literature. You can actually use EndNote, you can go to the library and get help uh, lessons on how to use it. It's an organising system for citations. So if you had to write something academic, you could use that system. And it stores all of your uh, literature. Oh, there it is. That's just what I look, it looks like. You've already just talked about that. Um, I don't think we have, well, maybe you can do this as a whole class. What I was going to get you to do was just look at those flags and think about how you could theme them up. So it's just another example of the same thing we did with the interview, but just how would you categorise, you can discuss with the person next to you, is there some key ways that you can group those flags? I'll just give you a couple of minutes. You can talk to each other about it. No right answer, remember? So have a go. We got any answers yet? Any suggestions? Yes. Oh, that's very technical. Okay. Are they all from continents? I've, it's a bit hard because I haven't got the countries under them. Okay, yes. Excellent. Okay. 
So an overall grouping could be continent, and then you could have some sub-themes, as you just said, of the different continents themselves. So that could be a way you analyse the flags. Over here, another one. Language. Language, very good. And how would that work? Are you going to have subgroups for the language? Possibly that could work. You could explore that, say, European languages. So again, it's geography, but you know, Asian tone or tonal languages, whatever. It's a way you could categorise. Other one? We're now getting into some quite economic status, yeah. maybe. Okay. Did anybody actually just do it by the looks of the flags? Yes, it does be intimidating. The shape. Okay, so the shapes that are on the flags. Anyone do it by colour? Yeah. Any other ones? Sorry. Symbol. Yeah. So that that could be similar, I guess, to that. Have we missed any? Oh, up the sorry, up the back again. Lines. Yeah, yeah. So, so is that is that part of your shapes? Yeah. So we've got sub ones like diagonal. How the lines are going? <laughs> we've got circles, crosses. So you can see we just keep an overall theme and add a lot of the sub things. Any others? Religion. Interesting. Oh, that really should be on the other side, I think. Right here. All right, so you get to see how many choices you could make. That was a decision we as the researcher just made. It possibly could be that you're going to use more than one. You might use, you know, several. But you can see how many different interpretations you can get out of one little set of flags. There's nothing wrong with having them just by how they look. And there's nothing wrong with having them like this. It really does depend, as the gentleman up the back said, what are we researching and, you know, what is our question, what's the objective of what we want to know. But just gives you an idea of how, you know, how broad it can be. All right, that was a bit of fun. Okay, let's move to analysing qualitative data. We went through this, but this does help you. Um, you've obviously got interviews in your, in your exercise, but there's lots of other things which we talked about that you would most likely use this uh, for. So if you're at work and you've got given something and you were asked to design a project, this helps you work out um, which method you're going to use. Uh, we've already talked about this. It's mainly about patterns and meanings. Coding we did when we were in the break without any audio visual, but we've just been doing all of that in all of these exercises that I've been giving you. The one that really goes into coding a lot is the methodology grounded theory. It has a very structured approach to coding. So if you're ever thinking of doing that methodology, you will need to explore coding even in more way, or you absolutely love coding, um, that's a good method. Uh, just skip over these, you'll have all this. 
We've done that. That's what we were doing. That's where we were up to when the power came back on. And that's all going to be in your... Okay, good. Now we finally get to the bit where you're probably pretty hands-on. Who's had a look at the Envo in vivo system? Two people and something to speak to the back. Hopefully some people have a look and no one is going to be a student. So try and get to have a little play with it and have a look around first. But this might help you and there are some other tools to it. I'll just run through, oh, this first is just an example of my nodes from one of my, from one of my pieces of research. Uh, now, the, in this, this was the version before, so in vivo updates quite regularly. So that in that day they were called, uh, do you still have tree nodes? That's basically the collection of nodes. The terminology might be slightly different. We didn't use child nodes. Okay, so the key thing you need to know about in vivo is you have sources. Now, your source, I think, has been given to you because it's the five interviews. That's your sources of your data that you've got to work with. But you can see in mind there from the yellow folders up on the screen, I had a lot of data. Okay, so their lists of councils in Victoria that I worked with. This was actually my PhD. And they all had a folder with stuff in it, 60 documents. But it gives you an idea of what you can load in. If you ever have to use it in another project, you can load lots of things in. It has a big capacity now to take large PDFs video and different things. So it's useful to know that you can just load them all in there. And again, you can see that it takes quite a bit of organisation to actually keep them running smoothly. On the other side, the nodes, that's, that's what yours will start to look like. So you can see the top one up here that says barriers to capacity. It has subnodes or child nodes under it. It actually had another set. Now, all this is really doing for me is helping me as the researcher to make sense of all of this massive amount of data. Now, I could have had other, I actually did. At one stage, I had tree nodes like this or, or nodes, and I had to cut some out or group them together because it was unmanageable. So if in your exercise you ended up with 20 nodes or 20 subnodes, you need to look at how to collapse them into bigger groups. Or maybe they're not relevant. So that's another thing you think about. Now what you do there is, under those nodes, you drop or drag the piece of the interview that you want to be under that node. Now it can also be under more than one node. So I don't know what they're saying, something around community or locals. And they might have some views that actually fits two of your nodes. So don't be afraid to just put it in to more than one. Any questions around that? On the same page? So that's, it's a fairly easy system once you get um, familiar with the terms. All right. Now, you'll see this on the slide, it's a PDF that I put online, but it just is from the help notes from MVivo and it tells you the types of things you can put in there. And we've mentioned most of the ones there. So. Interviews, articles and documents is pretty straightforward. The one on the right actually was the assessment, I think, last year was a survey, not interviews, or no, with another group that Paul and I did. So you can actually put in survey results there. For example, I'm currently leading a project which has a survey with um, quantitative, you know, stats. But some of the questions in the survey actually ask people for their opinion. Just be careful when you do that writing a survey because if you put too many of those in, you'll end up with lots of things to have to analyse. So be very careful about that. But sometimes you might want to know uh, what's your opinion about this. So you would then swap from SPSS for the stats over to MVivo to analyse that. So you can actually load in surveys from SurveyMonkey, from other programs and that into MVivo and get out the data that you want to use. You can also have audio and video. So I've seen big pieces of research on um, audio, on groups, um, different things there, video. You can do web pages, social media, YouTube videos. 
photograph. So in Photo Voice, you might use En Vivo to actually analyze the photos if you were using that in a particular way. So lots of sources of data. This was interesting. You probably, you won't use this this time, but you're using the nodes over on the far side. So the node section, that's you. Uh, this cases, which is uh, a capacity in the system, if you, you can see there they've given this example of a lady and they've got a photo and they've got her, um, some video and an interview and some notes, different things there, demographics. So if you were doing phenomenology, for example, remember you're just dealing with a small number of people but you're very in-depth around each individual person, you maybe should use the case part of in vivo rather than just the node section. But mostly people would use the nodes. How do you, has anyone created their own nodes yet? Good. Okay. Easy? Oh. <laughs> Not quite so sure about that. Okay, but pressing the button is actually quite easy as long as you can find it, right? So it's, it's, it's intuitive in the sense that it's similar to a normal computer system where you've got to look across the top for the different things that you want. And there's the example there um, of where you find the node button. So it says there, it's got instructions for you. Go to the Create tab in the Nodes group and click on Nodes. So you just follow those instructions. Now remember, if you're going to make... Now what you do to get a sub-node is you press... Once you've got your node, you just right-click on that node, so that category, and it'll ask you, do you want to create another one? Type in the name and it'll come up in a hierarchy. Do the librarians help you with this in... Uh, you, are you going to the library to use the software or do you have to get? So don't be shy to ask librarians. They're very clever people um, here at UQ. So that's how you just do that. Oh, there we go. It tells you how you can create a child node. Um, interestingly enough, and there's something there on this bit here that says... If you turn on the aggregation butter, it will tell you how many... Um, so when it says sources and references, the references are how many times you're putting in a piece of the, the data, like as your uh, evidence. So if someone said something and you're sliding it in under agriculture, the, it will tick over a number. And you could actually then turn on this button that says the economy node. So you've got economy node, sub-node, child node, agriculture, fishing jobs and tourism, as you're sliding things into those child nodes, it will tick over the number for the, um, the node itself, which I thought could be useful if you need to know how you're going with um, how many bits of evidence you've got in each node. So, now, do you have to do queries after you've got all this in to your nodes? I'm thinking you probably do. Word frequency, okay. All right, so you can go to the query wizard, which looks like that. Oh, actually, I can see it's the one over there, if it's word frequency. That. Do you have to comment on it as well? Okay, so it's asking your attendant about what, how many times that was that you Probably will even meet him next week. You can ask Paul next week. He'll be on. Go and have a look for the questions and ask him or ask your tutor. Okay, so this will, I'll just keep moving though for that. So that you can see word frequency, text search or query wizard. So the idea of the query wizard is when you want to look at things, for example, like the relationship between different nodes. Do you have to actually do that in your... Have you got the sheet there, sorry? All right, so you don't quite know yet. All right, well, we'll just 
briefly do this. You can have this to refer to if you need to when you get the second half. So there's the word frequency query that there in the slide. It's a bit like Wordle. You know, you're familiar with that software that makes the bigger size is the one that's mentioned more often. The smaller print is obviously less referred to and it gives a visual depiction of, so in that case there, people and east are the most frequently word used word and then like it and then go down into the smaller ones. That's how you interpret that. The text search is quite interesting too. It can bring up another, like a tree graph there on this other side. So um, you can have a little play with this if you, of course, you have lots of spare time, I know, at this time of semester. There's also matrix coding. Now that one is the one about the relationship. So you can see on the example there, the example is show me attitudes about water quality by communities. This, you may not have to do something like this, but it's good to know if the software can do it. Because in SPSS, obviously, you're always looking at variables and correlations and different things but you can actually do that in here as well. So what you do is you go in and you get the particular ones. So you get the section on water quality attitudes by community and it brings up five communities on the side there, Atlantic, Betty Strait, Cedar Island, Davis, Gloucester. And then it's telling you how many people in those different communities had a positive mixed or negative attitude towards water quality. So you can then make some um, interpretation of the data from that. So you can see, obviously, the first one, it's nearly half and half. So we have, you know, half people saying yes, half saying negative no. Other ones are different. You've got the highlighted one there. The highest one is the one at the bottom. If you double click on those cells, you can actually get more information. And the visual one is kind of fun. So you've done all the hard work and you want to show this to your boss or funder or whoever it is and you can have some really nice visual representations through the bar, the columns or the tree graphs or the other ones there. So they've now got some really nice things. You can build your own maps. So it's a bit of a mind map there over on one side. The other is a concept map. They're really useful things to have if you're trying to explain things to other people. Rather than just give them a lot of text, you can actually do that. And of course, bear in mind, you can put these things into reports and that as well. So if you're trying to explain something of your data, instead of just having the common graph or the common just text word, you can make it look a little bit more interesting. That's it. Any questions? Okay, so don't be shy. Like, if you've got a tutor, right, you can talk to them this Don't be shy to ask them for this. If you are actually agreeing to a complicated question for one thing, but you have to make sure you have to So the question then was around do we analyse by the language used or by the themes that are people are just talking about? So what you're touching on there is something we were going to do in the first half an hour, which is around the difference between content analysis and discourse analysis. So you'll see when I put the slides up, content analysis is around making themes out of what is being said, but discourse analysis is an analysis of the actual language. And I would say that's less common than content analysis. So you would not be asked here to do discourse analysis. So generally speaking, qualitative research is around themes. 
So there are other things that you can do with it. Good question. Anything else? Okay, so um, I will be back in week 12 with Paul. We do a lecture on mixed methods, which hopefully will bring it all together and hope, and then by then you will have completed all these things, you maybe have some other questions. But thank you very much for your patience today with the problems we've had with the technology. And don't forget if you do have any qualitative things that you're working on, I know there is some going on, please feel free to email me about it. So thanks very much, all the best. Just me.